Good afternoon. I call to order the informal interactive hearing of the General Assembly with Indigenous peoples held in accordance with Resolution 71-321 of 8 September 2017. I'd like to warmly welcome all of you to this meeting. This hearing provides an opportunity for all relevant stakeholders to reflect on possible further measures necessary to enhance the participation of Indigenous peoples representatives and institutions in relevant United Nations meetings on issues affecting them, as well as inform the intergovernmental process of the General Assembly that will resume at its 75th session. With your permission, I will now deliver my opening statement. Thank you all for being here. In particular, I'd like to thank Assistant Secretary General Gilmore and Ms. Walid Abu Bakrain, sorry, uh, as our distinguished chair and all the elders and indigenous representatives we have in the room today. I have the honor to serve as the President of the United Nations General Assembly. And so I get many opportunities to speak at the United Nations. But I know that this is not the same for everyone in this room. That's why today it is your hearing, not mine. And that's why I want to limit myself to a few brief remarks before turning the floor over to you. In doing so, I'll make four main points. First, I want to talk about how we got here. It was nearly 100 years ago when indigenous peoples first asserted their rights on the international stage. But they did not see much progress, at least until 1982, when the first working group on the in indigenous populations was established. And in 2007, the rights of indigenous peoples were finally set out in an international instrument. Let us be clear here. Rights are not aspirational. They are not ideals. They are not best case scenarios. They are minimum standards. They are non-negotiable and they must be respected and promoted. Yet here we are, more than a decade after the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. And the fact is, these rights are not being realized. That's not to say that there has been no progress. In fact, we heard many success stories during yesterday's opening of the Permanent Forum. But they are not enough. Which is why, as my second point, I want to say that we need to do much more. Last September, the General Assembly gave my office a new mandate. It requested that I organize informal, interactive hearings to look at how indigenous peoples can better participate at the United Nations. So that's why we are all sitting here. But before we launch into our discussions, I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. I know that many of you were disappointed with the General Assembly's decision last year. After two years of talking, many of you wanted more than these interactive hearings. We cannot gloss over this, and that's why I want to address it from the outset. But I must also say this, things may be moving slowly, but they are still moving. When our predecessors formed the first indigenous working group in 1982, their chances were slim. Many doubted whether an international instrument could be adopted. And frankly, it took longer than it should have. But it still happened. So we need to acknowledge the challenges and frustrations. We cannot sweep them under the rug. But we also cannot let them take away from the opportunities we have in front of us. And that brings me to my third point on our discussions today. This is your hearing. So please be blunt. Please be concrete. Please be innovative. Like I have said, we should not pretend that everything is perfect. Major problems persist, particularly at the national level. And we need to draw attention to them. Today, however, we have a very specific mandate. And that is to explore how we can carve out more space for indigenous peoples on the international stage. That's why I ask you to focus on the future of our work here at the United Nations and to try to come up with as many ideas and proposals as possible. 
In particular, we should look at the following questions. Which venues and forums are most suitable? What modalities should govern participation? What kind of participants should be selected? And how will this selection happen? We should also try to form a broader vision. This will allow us to better advise the General Assembly's ongoing process to enhance indigenous people's participation. Finally, next steps. As you know, this is our very first informal interactive hearing. There will be two further hearings, next year and the year after. Then, during what we call the 75th session of the General Assembly, negotiations between governments will start up again. Turning back to today, the immediate outcome of our hearing will be a President's summary. But I'm confident that the longer-term outcome will be yet another step in the direction of change. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I will conclude. My main job now is to listen. And I thank you for your attention. And I now give the floor to Mr. Andrew Gilmore, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. President, um, Excellencies, colleagues. The rights of indigenous peoples in many places around the world are today at best unmet and at worst under active threat. And that is why we are very grateful to the President of the General Assembly for organizing this important event and for his other efforts in this regard. The participation of indigenous peoples in UN processes has definitely increased since the 1980s when the UN formally began to work on this topic and their participation has been recognized not only as a clear right, but also as a valuable contribution to our common understanding of some vital global issues. In the UN human rights system, we are fortunate, and fortunate enough to have the special rapporteur, the UN expert mechanism, and the UN voluntary fund for indigenous peoples. But here in New York, we have worked for over a decade with the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which has been a very useful tool in raising awareness of their issues. Moreover, to take an example, the Paris Agreement acknowledged the important contribution of indigenous people's traditional knowledge when it comes to mitigating the effects of climate change. In recent years, the UN system has sought to create a space so that the expertise of indigenous peoples can play a proper role in our work. And this effort is about making the UN inclusive of indigenous people's representative institutions. Thus, we welcome the call for regional consultations by the General Assembly last year as an important opportunity to ensure that the views of as many indigenous communities as possible, including women and youth groups, are fully considered in every effort made being to advance their agenda. Institutions of indigenous peoples manifest themselves in a wide variety of forms, as federations of peoples, autonomous governments and parliaments, community-based decision-making bodies, and other groups. While some states formally recognize these institutions, others do not. We feel that our challenge lies in ensuring that, regardless of their status in their own countries, they have the ability to participate in UN processes. Should we fail to achieve this, we will miss out on hearing the voices of all indigenous people's representatives from all regions of the world. And that is why this meeting today, which is part of the wider consultation process, could be so important. And against this backdrop, and perhaps for me it's the, the second elephant in the room that the president referred to, we find the current trend of increased violence against indigenous defenders in many countries to be profoundly troubling. We find courageous indigenous representatives trying to defend their ancestral lands and their local environments being threatened, brutally assaulted, and in many cases killed. It should surely go without saying that we, the peoples of the UN Charter, must include indigenous peoples. That the phrase, leaving no one behind from the SDGs, must include indigenous peoples, and non-discrimination must include indigenous peoples. But it is essential that we actually do more to show that we understand this. And this meeting is a useful step in this regard. Thank you very much. I thank the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights for his statement. I now give the floor to Ms. Mariam Valet Abu Bakrain, Chair of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues.
Thank you. Distinguished uh, Excellencies, Delegate from Member States, Indigenous brothers and sisters, I would like to express my gratitude to His Excellencies, Ms. Rolav Lajstak, President of the General Assembly, for inviting me as the Chair of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to this informal interactive hearing. The Permanent Forum acknowledged the effort and commitment made by President of the General Assembly to carry forward the consultation and establish the framework for future negotiations. I would like also to thank you for your excellent presentation yesterday at the opening ceremony of the Permanent Forum. It was a very, very strong message for indigenous peoples and for the Forum. The Permanent Forum recognizes the existing current good practices within the United System that allow for the participation of indigenous peoples under the Economic and Social Council and the Human Rights Council in particular. Their participation at the session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and the Expert Mechanism on the Right of Indigenous Peoples. I also check against delivery, not that the participation of indigenous peoples is limited at other venues, many of which deal with uh, issues that directly affect the rights and well-being of indigenous peoples. Current processes do not recognize the status of indigenous peoples governance and representative institutions many which are already recognized by member states at the national, local, and community level. We need a kind of harmony between these two uh, recognitions. Indigenous peoples' representative institutions are not NGO. Our chiefs, our parliamentarian, has to sit in a di dignity um, places. Member states recognize this at the national level, but the United Nations has not developed a mechanism to recognize this, and this needs to be resolved. Over the past years, indigenous peoples are increasingly participating at the United Nations, but indigenous peoples still remain marginalized from important decision-making process. We need to do more. Indigenous peoples' participation at the United Nations has been a positive experience. Indigenous peoples have demonstrated that they wish to and can work peacefully in partnership with member states to address their issues and of common concern, such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, climate change, as mentioned by Mr. Gilmour, peace building, and other emerging issues. To conclude, indigenous peoples are counting on the General Assembly to move this process forward so that indigenous people, peoples can continue to enrich the work of the United Nations for our common good. The Permanent Forum remain ready and committed to advance this important process, and I would like to emphasize on the fact that we don't want that this hearing come with a any kind of diminution of participation rights that indigenous peoples have already within the United Nations. Thank you. I thank the Chair of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I now give the floor to Chief Wilton Littlechild, a Cree lawyer, advocate, and former member of Parliament who has worked to advance the rights of Indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world, who will deliver a keynote statement. Please. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, Niga and Kahkio. Thank you very much. I just bring you greetings in my language. And yes, 
Mr. President, the General Assembly resolution last fall was a disappointment to Indigenous peoples in that we have not yet achieved the goal of enhancing our participation at the UN. However, we can all work together with the resolution in order to advance the issue. And we know member states stand with us in this work. Indigenous peoples have made significant contributions to the international system, and we will continue to do so. The Permanent Forum, MRIP, and the Special Rapporteur are providing excellent input to the General Assembly on this and other issues. These important relationships will continue, continue to increase to serve us all. For the states who have concerns about our participation, know that Indigenous peoples want to work with you to address your concerns. I truly believe that by working together, we can reach a common understanding that Indigenous peoples' enhanced participation would be an overwhelming success for the General Assembly. The adoption of the Declaration was the culmination of incredible efforts by Indigenous peoples, allies, and member states. Internationally, significant progress on the Declaration is ongoing. To date, the General Assembly has reconfirmed the United Nations Declaration at least eight times, and that is something to celebrate. Indigenous peoples are actively implementing the Declaration in governance, in negotiations, and yes, in litigation. Human rights education is growing, and the Declaration is being used in diverse ways at the community level. Globally, Indigenous peoples and states are learning about the Declaration and how to use it to promote harmonious and cooperative relations, mutual respect, understanding, and shared prosperity. The current process to provide for increased participation of Indigenous peoples within the UN system must not be used to undermine in any way the UN Declaration. This process should be recognizing our status as positive contributing actors at all levels of the UN. To fail to determine ways and means for ensuring Indigenous participation is inconsistent with Articles 41 and 42 of the Declaration. In particular, in denying Indigenous participation at the UN General Assembly, no substantive reasons have been provided except that some states are firmly against such involvement. Some states are also insisting they must determine who is Indigenous in regard to Indigenous participation in UN bodies. Such positions are discriminatory and contrary to international human rights law. States should not be seeking to renegotiate what was explicitly rejected during the negotiations on the UN Declaration. In the ways and means of promoting participation at the UN of Indigenous representatives on issues affecting them, the report of the Secretary General, it is emphasized, I'm sorry, excuse me, it is emphasized that in accordance with the UN Declaration, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to self-identify as such, the right to self-determination, and the fact that there is no agreed definition of Indigenous peoples should be borne in mind. And I underscore, it is important to ensure that the process to determine recognized Indigenous peoples representatives strengthens Indigenous peoples participation through their institutions, representative bodies, and organizations. In international law, there's no legal basis to insist that states must determine which peoples or persons are indigenous. UN treaty bodies and mechanisms have repeatedly emphasized the right of indigenous peoples to self-identification. Some proposals put forward by states fell short 
in failing to fully respect the UN Declaration. In the operative paragraph 33 of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, Article 2, indeed, of the Declaration affirms Indigenous peoples and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples, and individuals have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their rights, in particular, that based on their Indigenous origin or identity. In this whole context, it's worth recalling preambular paragraph 18 of the UN Declaration, and I quote, convinced that the recognition of the rights of Indigenous peoples in this Declaration will enhance harmonious and cooperative relations between the state and Indigenous peoples based on the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, and good faith. In order to safeguard the integrity of the international human rights system and uphold existing commitments, it's critical that states remain supportive of enhanced participation by Indigenous peoples. We can find a way forward working together. To the states, you have nothing to fear in creating space for the participation of Indigenous peoples. Yes, we have called for attention on our concerns, but we also have always offered solutions. What have we contributed to the human family, for example? Let, remind, let me remind you very briefly the recognition of spiritual rights. Focus on climate change, the extended family, indigenous laws, restorative justice, justice circles, sports and traditional games as human rights, that Indian treaties are international and sacred agreements promoting peaceful coexistence, holistic health and leadership by our elders. These among other indigenous perspectives are benefits to humankind. We have more to offer. Finally, Mr. President, there are three specific recommendations I want to make, but in the interest of time, I will submit them in writing and simply conclude by saying, when I first came here 40 years ago, I asked my elders, what is it that you're seeking from the international arena? And this is what they said. All we want is recognition, respect, and justice. So I ask you all today, do we have recognition? Do we have respect? And do we have justice? And I leave that to you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Chief Little Child for his statement. I now give the floor. I thank the representative of Russian Federation. I now give the floor to the representative of Organisasi Pribyomi Papua Barat. Dear Excellency, UN General Assembly President, Many thanks for delivering the demands of the peoples of West Papua to the United Nations General Assembly President because the UN General Assembly never responsible on the resolution 448 that on the fifth session that set up West Papua or West New Guinea as non-self-governing territory according to the United Nations Charter Article 73. <coughs> Uh, that make we are suffering 55 years under the Indonesian colonialism since 1st October 1962 until today. <clears throat> After the act of free choice or referendum in 1969, the UN Secretary General Utan uh, 
the same, the same trick he used in 1962 of not allowing the General Assembly to debate or address the issue. But this time, members in General Assembly were more confident and ready to object. A technical point, I su suspect the UN Secretary General has engaged in illegal private negotiation with Indonesia and Netherlands to draft their text for a General Assembly resolution 200, uh, 2,504 in the 2024 session. In any event, the sequence of, of meetings since at the UN is General Assembly plenary meeting 1810. Some nations raise a point of order to object the lack of time. And I demanded time to consider this issue. Instead of allowing several weeks, they were then allowed six days to prepare. General Assembly plenary meeting 1812, a group of nations proposed an amendment to proposed text. In paragraph 44 of the meeting, the proposed amendment asked Indonesia to allow referendum by 1975, together with the Papua New Guinea. Then there is also a proposal for a, a German additional time to allow nation to further consider this issue. The meeting extend in, into their lunch time and some continue in their afternoon meeting. General Assembly plenary meeting 1813 in paragraph 135, a vote is held about proposed a German additional time and fails. In paragraph 168, a vote is held on amendment to ask referendum by 1967 and fails. In paragraph 182, a vote is held on original proposed text and su success. The referendum in West Papua was rejected by UN General, uh, UN Secretary Gen General Representative Mr. Or 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 Ortizan Fernando because it was done by consultation system throughout the 1,025 representative who was chosen by Indonesian military and hide them in the, in the military dormitory. May, it is UN General Assembly may, may, may I ask the speaker, uh, if possible, to, to stick to the, to the agenda of this uh, meeting. And uh, here we're talking about reflection and possible further measures necessary to enhance the participation of indigenous peoples, representation and institutions in relevant United Nations meetings on issues affecting them, as well as inform the intergovernment process of the General Assembly. So if you could, could uh, stick to this. Thank you. Uh, once more. You continue? Yeah, you, you may continue with your remarks, but stick oh. to the agenda. Okay. Yeah, this is the last. Yes, it is uh, UN General Assembly obligation to set up to set up it in the Charter of the United Nations Article 73 for granted independence of all non-self-governing territory. So UN General Assembly must give referendum for West Papua according to international practice, not like in consultation system throughout 1,026 uh, representatives where Indonesia done in 1969. Thank you. I thank the, represent the representative of organization Premium Papua Barat. I, I thank the representative of Metis Nation. I now give the floor to the representative of Indonesia.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and a very good afternoon to all of us. We thank the President of the United Nations um, General Assembly for convening this meeting, and my delegation takes this floor with regards to two points. First, pertaining this very important deliberation that we have this afternoon, and then responding to the unthreatful statement made by the previous um, delegation. So we thank the co-facilitators who have been working uh, vigilantly with the member states on the resolutions as well as these particular issues. And since the very beginning, Indonesia has been an, a very active um, member, um, deliberating all the possibilities that we have had as well as all the pertinent elements with regards to the enhanced participations of the indigenous peoples within the UN system and all the relevant UN mechanisms. Indonesia remains committed to the work um, of these particular issues and will continue to work constructively on these issues. This is indeed a complex issue and conditions of the countries differ from one another. Specificities are highly, um, um, highly noted and some might have even particular group of indigenous peoples while some might consider all populations to be indigenous like in the case of Indonesia. Nevertheless, we reached a consensus based on the resolutions and the UN uh, General Assembly has been mandated to work, to continue working on ways to enhance participation of indigenous peoples until the 75th session of the UNGA. And I think we should continue with this particular spirit. And secondly, Mr. Chair, if you um, indulge me, my delegation would also like to draw the attention on the currently made statement of the organization um, called Organisasi Pribumi Papua Barat, which is not only providing the false statement and fabricated facts, but also misled this very important deliberation. It is very unfortunate to see again that this very important meeting, hearing um, our consideration as well as consultations with the representative of the indigenous peoples has been misled and utilized by irresponsible groups and individuals claiming to represent West Papua. Without the intention to speak outside of the topic, but my delegation is compelled to, um, to give this particular um, statement that we request the president as well as the chair to disregard and not include those statements in the report. We, we believe that it is important to also underline that the issue of West Papua has been um, concluded within the United Nations and through the resolutions of 2504 that we have in 1969, the issue of the territorial integrity of Indonesia with the inclusion of West Papua is final and remains valid up until now. And we cannot tolerate the breach of the UN Charter as well as one of the most important articles in the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous Peoples when it comes to the sovereignty of states. Nevertheless, Mr. Chair, my delegation remains committed again to the work of the UNGA and to the work of the UN system with regards to the um, promotion and the protection of the rights of the indigenous peoples as it is applicable. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I thank the representative of Indonesia. I now give the floor to the representative of Seneca Nation of Indians. <laughs> 